presence of the Lord is here. Breathe him in, church. Breathe him in. Good morning. I am Terry Shepard, the assistant youth pastor here at Christ Church. I'd like to welcome everyone here and those watching online. Thanks for joining us today and wading through that snow. <laughs> Let's open in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to continue to invade us. Holy Father, your people are here and we're gathered in this place wanting more of you. Lord, we honor you and you alone. We give you our worship, we give you our praise and thanksgiving this morning. And we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to invade us even more. Move our hearts to action for your kingdom as we soak in just how trustworthy your word is. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. So this morning, we're starting a new series called Why Do We? Why do we, as Jesus' church, do some of the things we do? In this six-part series, we'll look at things like baptism, Holy Communion, the Lord's Prayer, and why do we share our faith? Even if you're well familiar with these staples of the Christian faith, I believe you'll find some many new insights as we go through this. This series will give all of us a greater understanding of some of the common but powerful things we do as the Christian church. Today we lay the foundation why we as Jesus' church trust the word of God, which of course is the Bible. We Christians should base our entire faith on the Bible. Why? Because the truth matters. Scripture tells us that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's found in Hosea. And in 1 Thessalonians, it says, prove all things through the word of God. Our very eternal lives depend upon us knowing the truth. Trust and truth of God's word go hand in hand, and it's too important just to take someone else's word for it. Each of us needs to know for our own selves. Today, we're going to approach the topic of trusting God's word through the eyes of the apostles John and James, and then we're going to wrap it up with a testimony of someone who years ago was just trying to figure this faith thing out from scratch. The song said, we are his, heirs of salvation, purchase of God, born of the spirit, and washed in his blood. Those are all biblical statements, as you can see. Let me ask you. Is it reasonable for our mighty God to expect us, his heirs of salvation, which he purchased with the high, high price of Jesus' blood? Then he gave us the generous gift of his very own spirit to carry in our bodies. We are born of the spirit. And Jesus washed us in his blood, which means he tr we traded him all of our sin for his holy death which gives us believers eternal life. With all he's done for us, is it reasonable for our God to expect us to trust what he says? There are hundreds of passages in the Bible that takes the position, either explicitly or implicitly, that says that the Bible is nothing less than the very word of God. Around 3,800 times the Bible declares, God said, or thus says the Lord. Let's just look at a few of these to see what God has to say about his own words. In Deuteronomy, God says, You shall not add to the word which I commend you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. In other words, don't mess with God's scripture. Anytime God says, you shall not, yeah, don't do it. It's not a good idea. God is strongly implying that his word is trustworthy, good, and perfect, just the way it is. Much of our modern culture, including many of those who call themselves Christians, say that the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, is outdated and does not apply today. It is hated because it calls the progressive agenda being pushed on the world what it is, sin. And people don't want what they do called sin. God counters that with a simple yet very powerful statement. He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is saying, my word is valid and trustworthy from the beginning to this day and to the end of time. No, the Old Testament is not outdated. It still speaks pure truth to us today. 
We don't get to pick and choose what parts of the Bible we follow, even if it hurts our feelings. Who are we to judge God's word? Point blank, if the Bible calls it sin, then our opinion doesn't matter. If we follow God, we follow his word. You may ask, why can't I just follow Jesus and leave the Bible well enough alone? Well, it's because of powerful statements such as what the Apostle John says who who Jesus is in the Gospel of John. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The he and the Word that John is talking about in this verse is Jesus. And then in the book of 1 John, he says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes, and we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of God, or excuse me, the word of life. Again, the apostle John is obviously speaking of his friend Jesus, with whom he was very familiar as one of the 12 disciples. Let's look at these verses again while I insert Jesus' name in the appropriate places. It will make them crystal clear. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus was with God in the beginning. The next verse, we proclaim to you Jesus who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw Jesus with our own eyes and touched Jesus with our own hands. Jesus is the word of life. Jesus is the word. Jesus was the Logos, or the spoken word of God. Jesus was the expression of God on the earth through his words and actions, which are written in this book. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen my Father. Since the word, which is Jesus, was God, and Jesus was the expression of God on earth, then this, my friends, is literally Jesus in written form full of Holy Spirit power. Jesus is revealed all the way through from Genesis to Revelations, the beginning to the end. When we look at further truths in 1 Corinthians, Paul also recognized that the things he was writing were the Lord's commandments. And these commandments were acknowledged as such by the believers as stated in 1 Thessalonians. Peter proclaimed the certainty of the scriptures and the necessity of heeding the unalterable and certain word of God in 2 Peter. And catch this one. Further on in 1 John chapter 4, the apostle John too recognized that his teaching was from God and to reject his teaching was to reject God. Let me say that again. To reject John's teaching was to reject God. That's a bold statement, but look who said it. The Apostle John had been the favored disciple of Jesus. When he wrote this, John was an old man, yet he was confident that in his younger days, he had most certainly walked, talked, and communed with the Almighty Jesus, the Savior of the world, and he was willing to risk his life to proclaim that. John knew what he was talking about. He knew that if you reject the teaching about Christ, you were rejecting God. Jesus was God as part of the Trinity. The conclusion is clear. To reject the Bible, or even parts of it, is to reject Jesus. As was pointed out by Scripture, Jesus is the Word of God in written form. Since Jesus is God, he is trustworthy, and the Holy Word of God in its entirety is perfect, true, and trustworthy. We could end right here because God's word is the final authority. However, the Bible also says that testimony is powerful. I mentioned earlier that there would be a testimony. It's mine. Many of you know how much God's word and prayer is a part of my life today, but it used to not be that way. Hopefully, this will encourage someone to look at the Bible in a new light. This is the one I'm on today. But if I were to build an altar to the Lord, it would look something like this. This is my story, at least a representation of it for the last 30 years. For the first 30 years of my life, none of this was included. Prayer represented here by my Jewish prayer shawl, it was not included. 
communion with the Lord, I didn't even know such a thing existed. And time spent with Jesus, yeah, no. (laughs) Certainly, the Holy Word of God wasn't even considered, and the gift of the cross, not even thought about. The outcome of that godless life was an appalling mess. I was a slow-moving train wreck and was dying a little more each day, and I knew it. I just didn't know what to do about it. This is my story now. But let's look and see how that came to be. Like I said, I didn't know what to do about it, but God did. But God showed up in a little meeting called MOPS, Mothers of Preschoolers in Phoenix, Arizona. We had just moved to Phoenix, and I didn't know anyone yet. The little article about MOP said it was a great place to meet other moms. I knew I needed a friend, and I wanted friends for my two-year-old son. Unbeknownst to me, it was a Christian organization. I didn't grow up in church. My life growing up was chaos at best, different kinds of abuse at the worst. By the time I was seven years old, I was destroyed from the inside out, and I carried that destruction with me right on into those mops meetings that happened to be held in a church. They were saying good things that captured my heart. One day, I decided to try church. I wasn't sure if I could do church because I didn't know the requirements of church. It took me about four weeks to get the nerve up to attempt church. Again, because I didn't know how to do church. What do I wear? Where do I sit? Do I keep my overactive two-year-old with me? Or someone mentioned a nursery. I don't really know what nursery means at church. You get the idea. Eventually, I went and did church. I was intrigued, and on my third try of church, God set the hook in my mouth, and I swallowed the proverbial hook, line, and sinker. This church had a testimony time during each church service, and one day a very nice lady stood up and said, God spoke to me, and then she told a lovely testimony. I about fell out of my chair. What do you mean God spoke to you? God doesn't speak to people, does he? I had no idea that God would speak to mere mortals. No way. Really? Her words, God spoke to me, hit me like a Mack truck square in the face. I realize now that that was the Holy Spirit getting my attention, but I had zero idea of that then. I just remember the hard pull of that fishing line in my mouth. I wanted that instantly, more than I have ever wanted anything else in my life, ever. God set a raging fire in my chest that day and that has never let up. I have never forgotten that day. I have never looked back. I started climbing that fishing line that day to see who was holding on to that fishing pole. I had to know. How do you start? Well, I sure didn't know. Apparently, you read the Bible. All the people of God around me said, read, read. I tried. I knew nothing about the Bible. I didn't understand it, nor did I have anyone to teach me. I had a vague idea that the Bible was of value somehow. It's kind of hysterical, but this is what I knew about the Bible. I knew there was a story of a big fish that swallowed a man. The fish didn't like how he tasted, so he spit him out. (laughs) And there was a boat full of, a big boat full of people, or excuse me, a big boat full of animals for some reason. That was about it. And I am not kidding. (laughs) That was what I knew of the Bible. So I didn't read it. For several years, I did go to church where I learned, but the Bible was elusive to me. I came into the Lord's kingdom as naive and dirty as anyone comes. I was still a slow-moving train wreck, but God didn't seem to care, and that really puzzled me at first. Later on, I learned about grace and mercy. However, he had planted a seed in my heart and started weeding out the dirt and the pain. A couple of years later, God dropped a Holy Spirit Bible bomb on me that definitely got my attention, and that is what set the love of the Word of God in motion. I do have to be a little vague on the details in this story as it's being recorded, and I don't want feelings to get hurt, but you will get the idea. This is probably one of those you-had-to-be-there moments, but try to look at it from a very new and fragile believer's eyes. One day, a very unsettling and hurtful thing happened. It crushed me on the inside. I was at a complete loss as how to handle it. 
I was still a train wreck, and I was nothing short of frantic, as I didn't yet have a strong faith foundation set in. I went to my bedroom and cried and tried to pray. I was a mess, and that was my prayer. Can anyone else relate? As I sat on the bed, there was the Bible that someone had given me as a teen just sitting there collecting dust. For some reason, I picked it up and threw it on the bed. It bounced open. I leaned over and glanced at it, and to my shock, it had opened to the exact thing that I had just prayed that over. The verse that opened up pertained to one thing and one thing only. It was not one of those verses that could cover a broad base of things. It was specific to one subject, and it was that subject. I didn't even know that verse existed. Mind blown. My thoughts went everywhere at once, like that picture up there. God would really do that for me? He would really bounce open my Bible to the exact thing I just prayed about? God does not do things like that, does he? Maybe for others, but not for me. But he did. I had no idea how to accomplish what the Lord had shown me in that verse. But one thing I knew by then is I was supposed to be obedient to God, as it says in James verse 125. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. I did do what he said, and then he blessed me very careful, by very carefully walking this baby Christian step by step through that whole year, heaping blessing upon blessing of revelation of the who he is, how much he cared for me and my family, and he ultimately fixed the terrible situation. My love for the Lord, or excuse me, my love for the word was ignited. I guarantee the Holy Bible is trustworthy, not because I say so. It is because God himself says it's trustworthy. I am just an example of his trustworthiness. In Psalm 119, it says, the sum of your word is truth. Yes, over the years, I learned that all of God's word is truth. As I look back now, I figured out that I didn't understand the Bible because I didn't read it. The more I read, the more I understood. God drew me into reading his word with a dramatic show of his power when he bounced open that Bible. But I didn't start hearing God speak until I started reading his word. As I read, I grew, and I started hearing from the Lord more and more. Now, I too have conversations with him, just like the lady in the church did. Later, I was invited to join a prayer group that that opened up many more heavenly doors. Well, here I am today, still reading, still praying, still learning, still growing, still making mistakes, but I can confidently say that the thing I wanted the most, I now have. I have a personal relationship with the Almighty God. It is vital to be in the Word. The more you read, the hungrier for the Word you will get. In Romans, it says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. We must feed our faith every day with the word so our faith is continually fed, which in turn grows our trust in him and his word. I'm in a place now that every time I finish a Bible, I get a new one that's either a different version or with different study notes so I can learn something new. If you like, feel free to come up and browse through any of these after service. I'd love to answer any questions you might have. Just don't be too busy or distracted to open this book. This is a command from the Lord. It's not a suggestion. Don't think it doesn't matter. As I said before, before your very life depends upon the accuracy of what you understand. Remember, too, the Bible is full of Holy Spirit power to help you. This quote from the late R, uh, Pastor R.C. Sproul is a sad but true statement. I think the greatest weakness in the church today is that almost no one believes that God invests his power in the Bible. Everyone is looking for power in a program, in a methodology, in a technique, in anything and everything but that which God has placed it, his word. He alone has the power to change lives for eternity, and that power is focused on the scriptures. If we trust God's word, we should be in God's word. As a Christian now, I experience the power that Pastor Sproul speaks of every day now. My life is different because I create time for myself to pray and spend time with the Lord. 
My devotional time for studying the Bible has literally created my spiritual growth. I absolutely cannot be without reading my Bible or prayer anymore. I cannot. As I prayed and researched this topic, I realized something new about myself. I have moved into a place where prayer and scripture have meshed to be one and the same. Today, my prayer life is so wrapped up in scripture that it cannot be separated. I pray through the scriptures. So this, like I said before, this is my story now. And it's a really, really good place to be. This is where I have learned to love to be. It took work, but it has been the best decision I've ever made. And now, my life goal, like the song we just sang said, is to speak Jesus over anyone that will listen. This takes us back to the beginning. After all he has done for us, don't you think it's reasonable for our Lord to ask for a relationship with him? Isn't it reasonable for Jesus to ask us to walk, talk, and act like we belong to him? The word of God makes it clear the place we learn and grow relationship with him is immersed in the holy living word of the Bible. Therefore, the only intelligent conclusion is that it is reasonable for him to ask us to read, study, and trust his holy words. Here's a few ideas of how you can apply these principles. First, just start reading if you haven't. Start with the Gospel of John if you've never read much of the Bible. Find a Bible reading plan in a Bible app or online. Read as a family. Join a study group. Jan and I have a ladies' study group going on twice a month after service. Come talk to us. Try praying through the scriptures. But hear this. Write this down. The key to a closer, closer relationship with God is time. Give Jesus a sacrifice of your time by being in the word and having quiet time with him. Create a quality time with the Lord. He says, be still and know that I am God. Turn your affections to God and bask in his presence. It takes time to develop this. Just keep at it. He will show up. Why? Because he created you and he wants to have a relationship with you. And just so you know, your relationship with the Lord will not look like mine, nor should it. God has a wonderful and special way to relate specifically tailored to you. He's that good. Worship team, you can come up now. A quick side note, I came from a hard family from a very poor and very hard part of the country. All of the adults around me when I was young that should have been protecting me and pointing me to God, well, they were broken people too. And by God's great grace and mercy, all of them, save one, turned to the Lord and entered his kingdom as dedicated men and women of God. God is in the business of redemption, saving, restoring, loving, blessing, and so much more. God not only reached down and saved me and my family, he continues to show me things that blow my mind. Opening this trustworthy book and spending time with him will be the greatest adventure of your life. Don't miss it. Let's pray. Holy Father, please cause a love and trust of your word to grow and spread through our hearts and across this great nation and beyond. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.